one of the pastors that serves over at Cross of Christ in Boise, and it's a privilege to come here and share God's Word with you tonight. Also, a warm welcome to our online worshipers this evening. Glad you could join us. We are continuing our series as we study in the book of Hebrews under the theme, The High Priest. And last week, Pastor Fry talked about how Jesus is our perfect high priest. I'm actually backing up one part in the series, and I have the first part in the six-part series, just the fact that Jesus is our great high priest, and we will find a comfort in that for us tonight. You have a sheet of paper, or the worship will be on the screens behind me. And this evening, if you are able, please stand for our opening response. We worship in the name of the great I Am, our Savior God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Heavenly Father, we have come to worship you. Draw, us ne- draw near to us by your word and forgive our sins. Speak to our hearts. Assure us of your loving kindness. Curb our wandering thoughts, that with undivided attention we may hear your voice and sing your praises. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who also lives and reigns with you. And you may be seated for our hymn.
We continue with our passion readings, and just because this is the first one for this season, you might recall last week for Ash Wednesday, you had some special opening readings for the season of Lent. And then there are seven different passion readings that are taken from the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're compiled and they bring together the passion story of Jesus as best as we can tell in chronological order. So starting tonight, we'll have number one, and then they'll go through number five through the six Wednesdays of Lent, and then you'll probably enjoy six and seven, the the death and the burial on Good Friday. This is the very first one, then, that kicks off the passion story of Jesus. We'll read it responsively, and you'll notice in this first lesson, a betrayer is predicted, and the betrayer himself is, is identified. But in the face of mankind's sin, we also see our Savior Jesus Christ give us the gift of his supper. And we also see him tell us about his command to love one another. Passion reading number one. Now the feast of unleavened bread was approaching and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. They said, Jesus said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad, began to say to him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus told him, But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, then God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Where I am going, you cannot follow now, but 
you will follow later. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the gift for forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Also, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactor. But you are not not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? It is not, is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table, my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This is God's word. We continue with our hymn. There was some miscommunication there. I, I had the, the hymn as how deep the Father's love for us, but... Oh, that's fine. We can do that then. Should we go to the sermon? Okay. Excellent. Sorry for any confusion. I might have had a different bulletin than you did, do I? Did I? And I apologize if that's the case. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, I'm going to ask you what goes through your mind or who you picture when you hear the word priest. When you hear the word priest, do you kind of think back to your Sunday school days and you think of the Old Testament picture where you have the, the man in the garb and the robes and the breastplate with all the little stones that represent the 12 tribes of Israel? Or maybe not something so attractive. Do you think of the priest who is the one who has the robes that have all kinds of blood spattered all over them because they've been slaughtering little lambs, innocent lambs, to pay for the sins of the people? Or when you hear the word priest, do you automatically think to more modern times? Uh, The priests of today. You know, somebody that maybe has the black shirt and the clerical collar with the long cross necklace on a chain. Or sadly, maybe a mugshot if you've been watching images in the news recently. When you think of the word priest, who do you think of or what do you picture? Maybe you're saying, well, when I think of the word priest, I don't really think anything at all because I don't have a priest, never had, and I don't have one now. Oh, yes, you do. The Bible tells us Jesus is our great high priest. I want you to listen carefully to Hebrews chapter 4. And here is a promise that we Christians hold. It says, we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Notice, God does not say, Christians, you had a great high priest once, or that you will have someday when you get to heaven. But in the present tense, ongoing, God says to the writer of the Hebrews, right now, you have. 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is our great high priest. Already last week you saw one of the gems and one of the comforts that we have because Jesus is our high priest. And during this series, as we go through the the letter to the Hebrews, we will continue to look at wonderful gems, different angles of this gem or this diamond about how Jesus is our great high priest. But I'm going to take you back to the very beginning. And we're going to start and just look at the very first three verses of the, the book of Hebrews. And as I take you back to the book of Hebrews... Maybe a little context will help us. And maybe Pastor Fry mentioned some of these things last week. But the book of Hebrews is an interesting book. It's one of those few books in the Bible that we really don't know who wrote it, humanly speaking. We know God wrote it. The Holy Spirit inspired it. We call it the writer to the Hebrews. But one of the reasons we don't have any introduction and we don't know who wrote it is because it starts so abruptly. It just jumps right in. We'll talk about that in a second. But we know from the letter itself, as we read the content and the context, we understand who the audience is and what the issue was. The the book of Hebrews was written to Christians who were of Jewish descent or Hebrew, the Hebrew people. They probably were Hebrew or Jews once and then they converted to Christianity. They maybe still lived amongst the Hebrew families and people and, and certainly their friends. And here was the problem. Those Hebrew family and friends were trying to pull these Christians back into Judaism. And you can tell just by reading the book some of their mindsets and some of their argumentations, you know. They were kind of trying to to lure these Christians back by saying, are you going to really give up everything that we have that's so great? Like all of our great patriarchs. All of our great leaders like Moses and David? Are you going to give up all of our great prophets, Elijah and Jeremiah? All the heroes of faith? Are you going to give all that up? Maybe more importantly, are you going to give up all of our practices? Really? You're not going to enjoy a Sabbath day ever again? You're going to do away with all the dietary restrictions? You're going to do away with all the priests in the temple worship? Seriously? You're not going to observe another festival? You've got to be kidding me. And you're going to give all that up. Why? Because of this one Jewish guy named Jesus? You're throwing everything away, all your traditions and all of your faith. Come back. Come back to Judaism. Of course, the writer to the Hebrews is saying just the opposite. Why would you go back when you have Jesus Christ? And here is a key theme in the book of Hebrews. The reason you don't want to go back is because Jesus is better. He's fulfilled all of that. You don't have to give up all your heritage. Just know who it all points to. Jesus is our great high priest. So you have this tug of war going on, right? The Jews are trying to pull these Christians back into Judaism. The writer of the Hebrews is saying, no, continue to believe in Jesus. Which is why then, the book starts so abruptly. You know most of the New Testament letters, how they start, right? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. You know, these flowery introductions, right? Grace, mercy, and peace belong to you. Dear saints in Thessalonica, right? You get the picture. Well, have you ever had that where you're, you're kind of sitting in the kitchen and all of a sudden you get a teenager who's really hungry? And he comes bursting down the steps and busts through into the room and says, Oh, I'm so hungry, give me something to eat. And you, well, okay, well, good afternoon to you as well. Um, how was your day? I mean, I mean, it's just so abrupt, right? That's how the letter to the Hebrews starts. It just comes and smacks you right in the face because the message is so very urgent. And the message is, Jesus is better. Consider how he is your high priest. Let's take a look then at Hebrews chapter 1, and let's start at the very first verse. And this is what God's Word says. Right away, hits it, gets to it as a sense of urgency. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Verse 2. But in these last days, 
He has spoken to us by His Son. Let's just pause there for a minute. First of all, did you see the inclusion? The Holy Spirit inspired the writer to the Hebrews to kind of put his arm around all the people and say, look, we, we, we still cherish all of our Jewish heritage because finally that's what has led to Christianity, right? All the promises and the history in the Old Testament pointed ahead to Christ, which is why he then says, and he kind of includes himself and everybody, he says, our ancestors. We all have Jewish beginnings. Now look at the themes start to come out right away. But in these last days, we have something or someone who is better. We have the Son of God himself. And now look at how he goes and gives these credentials, right? How the Son of God is so much better than the priests of the Old Testament. Look what he says as he goes on in God's Word. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. He goes on. Whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Let's just pause there. Of what prophet can you say that? Right? This is God himself, and he said... Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. You know, isn't that what we confess in the Apostles' Creed when we say that Jesus Christ will return to judge the living and the dead? What prophet is going to judge the living and the dead at the end of time? He says that he made the universe. Don't we confess in the Nicene Creed? We say, through him all things were made, right? He is the Son of God. What's the point? The point is, Jesus is the owner and he's the operator of this universe. And there is no Old Testament prophet or priest of which you can say those things. He goes on and it says in verse 3, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. In other words, the radiance of his Father's glory and he is, the mirror, he is the mirror image of the Father's essence. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is true God, one with the Father and the Spirit. And if he's the owner and the operator, he's the true Son of God, he is God himself, what's his owner's manual? He goes on to say, well, he governs all things, sustaining everything through his powerful word. So he governs and guides all things with his powerful word. The point is, no one can hold a candle to Jesus. Yes, folks, we have the prophets. Yeah, that, we don't have to abandon them. They pointed ahead to someone better. We now have God himself. He is our great high priest. How heavy is our load of sin? How weighty are the mistakes that we make? How weighty do they bear down on our consciences and bother us? One of the greatest things that all people crave is acceptance, the peace of forgiveness, and to erase a guilty conscience. Yes? Here comes in the very last verse of this text then what you might call the knockout punch. The mic drop. The be all end all. Here's why Jesus is better. He says in the very last verse, in verse 3, the last half, after he, namely Jesus, had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Everyone, including the Old Testament believers, those who are truly devout, who love their God and were looking forward to the promised Messiah, they crave the purification of sins. When you talk about the purification, when you use that word to a Jew, to an Old Testament Jew, they know exactly what you're talking about. See, 
for all of their disobedience and their wandering eyes and their wandering heart, for all of their sins of thought, word, and deed, for all of their selfish acts, just like ours, they craved purification for sins. They craved the cleansing of their conscience. They wanted to know that God himself had forgiven them. So you know what their mode of worship was, right? They brought little lambs, lay on them, the priest would lay on, on, on those little innocent lambs, the guilt of the people, and then right before them, they would slaughter them and shed their blood, and that would be a temporary payment for their sins. And every one of those little innocent lambs was pointing him ahead to the Lamb of God. When you would use the term purification for sins, every Old Testament Jew knew something else. What would undoubtedly jump into their mind was the great day of atonement, when the great purification for sins for the whole nation, the whole church, would be given and granted. And you know that story too, and I won't go through the whole thing, but you can read about it in Leviticus chapter 16, where they brought forward the two goats, Right, and, the, and the high priest would, would, would lay his hands on the one and he would, he would put, his, put all the sins of the people and then they would slaughter that goat for the sins of the whole community. That was the sin offering. And then you know what they did with the other goat. They put on him the sins of all the people and then someone was designated to take it out into the wilderness and that was the scapegoat. And this was a clear teaching on that great day of atonement that God would forgive and remove the sin forever. Forgive and forget. And what a great day that was for the purification of all Old Testament believers. But here's the thing. Those priests, whether they were slaughtering a lamb for a simple sacrifice, a guilt offering, or on the great day of atonement, when they would purify the people from all of their sins, they would offer sacrifices on an hourly basis. Day after day after day, week after long week, and month upon month upon month, and it just never ended. And they stood there, and when they had their temple duty, and you'd have the line of people, and the line of their animals, and the courtyards, and then the next day it would happen all over again. Now, did you notice what we read about the great high priest, Jesus Christ? Again, we see, it says, Jesus provided purification for sins, and then what happened? He sat down. And it even tells us where. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Quick illustration. In a minute here, we will have the wonderful privilege of offering our gifts to Jesus. And after I hand the, the plates to the ushers, what would you say if I went into the back, put on my jacket, took off this microphone, I grabbed my uh, computer bag, and I walked down the aisle. Of course, I wouldn't forget to take my lovely wife with me, but we would all, we, together, we would walk out, and, and then we would get into our car, and we would drive away. Right, right, right then, like here in a few minutes. And the ushers would finish gathering and everyone would kind of look at me and as I walked down the aisle with my jacket on. And then they'd kind of maybe, maybe they'd come forward and start looking at each other and all oh, you would be looking at each other kind of thinking to yourself, well, he's gone. He left the building. And then some of the ushers would whisper, well, I saw him sit down in his car and he, he left. Well, we would conclude something, wouldn't we? Guess we're done here, right? You'd say, well, um, it's kind of odd. He's, he sort of stopped, but we're done here. Why? Well, because the leader, the pastor, he left. He just took off. He left. He sat down in his car and left, went home. What do we conclude when our great high priest, Jesus Christ, gave himself? as the perfect sacrifice for every one of our sins of thought, word, and deed. And then unlike 
every other priest of the Old Testament because remember, Jesus is better. He sat down. Forty days later, where? He ascended and sat down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, like we confess in our creed. And from there, he guides and he governs the world for the good of his people and his church. Our conclusion is, the Lamb of God's work is done here. Your sins are paid for. You are fully and freely forgiven and there is no more sacrifices left for sins. No more deeds. No more you know, things we have to do. No. Not that there ever was. Jesus did it all. And His work is done. See, friends, even today, we crave, we long for someone who's bigger and better. We can know our sins are forgiven. i tell you a little story about a woman named Laura. Laura uh, made a few big mistakes in her life, and her pride got in the way. She lost her job. She also made some big mistakes and lost her marriage. She really didn't go to church much growing up, but she thought she would go and visit her priest because her heart was so heavy and her guilt so great. So she went to to visit her priest and she sat down in confession and with her head and her heart in her hands, figuratively speaking, she said, and she started confessing her her mistakes and, and after a couple of minutes she said, Father, is that alcohol I smell on your breath? And he said, yeah, yes, Laura, it is. And she was so disappointed. You know, because she, she wanted to go there. She wanted to know that her priest was, you know, it's in the morning. He's attentive. He's going to serve her. He's going to share with her, uh, you know. And, and instead, you know, he's drunk. She said, Father, I'm so disappointed. I came here because I wanted help. And you know what he said? Me too, Laura. Me too. You know, finally, friends, we all are humans, right? We all are frail. We all are looking for someone bigger than we are. Even pastors and priests, they make mistakes. We're looking for someone better, someone more perfect. Someone who can offer the ultimate sacrifice. Someone who can make us acceptable to our almighty creator. Someone who can forgive our sins. Someone who can purify us from every mistake we've ever made. We have that person because Jesus is our great high priest. And that's our comfort. People in this world will fail us. And sometimes we'll fail others. But we have one who will not. He is our perfect and great high priest who paid the ultimate sacrifice. And in the next six weeks, five weeks, plus Holy Week, we are going to see in picture after painful picture our great high priest who is God himself, we saw his credentials, the maker of this world, the owner and the operator, humble him. Himself and literally step in to take our punishment. Isn't that incredible? To step in and be spit in the face instead of us. To be slapped and mocked. To be hit and beaten. To be suffer, to suffer instead of us because of the sins and because of the punishment we deserve. And then he will give himself into death because he loves us. And he will pay for every one of our sins. And you know something? Our risen and glorious Savior, who governs and guides all things by his powerful gospel, he wants to solder and to cement home in your heart how much he loves you. And so our great high priest gives you these kind of promises. He says, By my wounds, Isaiah, tell these people they are 
healed. Paul, come here. Tell my people that because of my righteousness, they are righteous before God. John, I need you to write a letter. Come here. My blood purifies all of you from all of your sins. We go with these promises because Jesus is our great high priest. And you know he is because his credentials are incredible. And because his purification is finished and final, he sat down. His saving work is done. And you know what that means for you? It means you have 24-7 access to the Father now because Jesus is your great high priest. You know what that means for you? It means that every single day you live at peace with God because He offered Himself as the perfect substitute and sacrifice for you. You are loved and forgiven of all of your sins. You know what that means for you? It means He's sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And one day, just the right time, He's going to come back or call you home so that you can be with him forever. I can't say that of any prophet, any earthly priest, or any king. Rejoice. Jesus is our great high priest. Amen. And now may the true peace of God fill all of your hearts with the joy of believing in him. to honor God with the gifts of our hands, the offering will begin. This time we have our prayers for this evening, and we want to remember in our prayers Amanda Saunders, who has been hospitalized due to an illness. We ask God for his comfort and his healing. We'll bow our heads and pray, and then we will also join together at the end with the Lord's Prayer. We pray. Dear Father in heaven, you love the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. Thank you for this treasure of the gospel, for we are lost without it. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is our great high priest. We praise him, for he paves a way for our prayers. His work of purifying us is finished. Now he guides and governs all things for our good and the good of his holy Christian church. Tonight we also pray for patience and endurance for those who carry a cross for Jesus' sake and face ridicule or persecution for the sake of the kingdom. To this end, 
Be with our missionaries and chaplains, our young people who stand up for what is right even when they are pressured to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their Christian values. We include in our prayers those who carry heavy burdens tonight, the sick and chronically ill, those depressed and lonely, those experiencing pain in personal relationships or victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Father, grant them peace by showing them your promises. And finally, be with our caregivers, our pastors and counselors, our doctors and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them all, dear God. And you, O Lord, our great physician of body and soul, bring healing and strength to Amanda soon. All according to your gracious will, we ask you to bless her. Comfort her with your presence and your promise to make all things work for her well-being. Dear Lord God, by your word and sacraments, keep us faithful even to the point of death that we may receive your crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us all to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And our closing hymn. Now the light has gone away.
And thank you once again for letting me come and join you in worship uh, tonight. Uh, sorry for the little mix-up on the hymn. That was, that was my mistake. Uh, I thought I had it written in there, and, uh, but I apologize. Um, we, uh, I'm, I'm, it's a privilege to be a part of this rotation again. This is week two. Next week and week three, uh, you should have here uh, my partner, Pastor Matt Zimpelman, and he will take another look into Hebrews and take a look at that beautiful gem that Jesus, our great high priest, actually makes us priests. So kind of stay tuned. That'll be a neat study next week. May God bless your week.